Hello, all you hardcores out there. How are you doing? It's Russ here from Porker's Corner. Big sport. Today we're joined by Julian from uh, Jewelsby, my good friend, part of the commission. <laughs> a bit cringe that, isn't it, Julian? Yeah, so I've been off for a couple of weeks. Um, people must be wondering because I previously said I'm never doing YouTube again. I'm dis they, they started calling me on your channel, the reappearing man, didn't they? They said that Julian's effed you off, Porky, because you don't know what you're on with. He's stabbed you in the back. <laughs> stabbed you in the heart. Not in the back, in the heart. That's where I've stabbed like, you. Like Rico man. apparently got rid of me because I'm a tool. We had Rico on yesterday, the two-parter. <laughs> well, I some people... Know the who... up, Julian, don't they? Listen, the, it boils down to this, right? I'm going to be re really, really simple. I mean, sometimes I get disillusioned with boxing. But what it boils down to is this. So when I've been on for a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, four weeks, like like Terry and like Rico, so all you you out there, and I think it's a small number, I think most people who watch your channel are absolutely brilliant, but the small number who make this stuff up, like Julian's binge you off, et cetera, et cetera, the reason I've not been on is in contrast to you, not you, Porky, the guys with the tittle tattle, the gossip, you got too much time on your hands to even think about this stuff. The reason I've not been on is because I don't have a lot of time on my hands. I've had big presentations to big customers at work. I've got children. I've got two girls at uni. You've got all kinds of carnage and chaos going on in life. It's called real life. And sometimes I can get on two, three times a week, and sometimes I can't get on. And it's, it's as simple as that, isn't it, mate? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it, to juggle everything. Um, oh, it's uh, I, I never realized when I separated about six and a half years ago, whenever it was. I've always been a and it's not we'll talk about the boxing, but I've always been a hands on dad, done the baths, done the feeds, done the nappy changes, done all that kind of stuff. I've always been hands on, but you still don't realize when you when you married or you have a partner how you share everything, and then when even though my kids are growing up, I'm still running a big house and I'm and I'm still, you know what, I'm on my own. So all those people who are on their own, all those single parents, wow, they got my respect massively because see, like six years ago, I had a culture shock and I realised that food doesn't just appear in the cupboards and this just doesn't appear and my shirt doesn't just appear, you know, hung up in a wardrobe and it's like, it's really, really hard. So you just get to a stage, life's about priorities I've not seen much of my partner because she's been working crazy hours as well. She's got a good job and got to the stage. It's like family comes first, but the provider of all that is that is work. Work comes first and YouTube and Porky's Corner and everything else and chatting to my mates about boxing in forums and groups is a nice to have. If I have time to do it, I'll do it. And if I won't do it, it's because I ain't got time. It's as simple as that. Or, if, or I'm bored of a certain subject, so I'll just withdraw. Yeah. What did you think to show last night after you went to cinema to see Napoleon? <laughs> yeah, we went to see Napoleon. So we, we missed probably the first hour of the show. I'll catch it with it at some point or I might not. And uh, came back in and I caught the start of the McCarthy and uh, Garber fight. And then I had two rounds in, three rounds in, I said to George, the dog, right, George, come on, it's time to go for a walk. I thought that were a good opportunity, good time to come in. So that looked like an absolute stinker. Uh, two southpaws, one wanting to fight and one not wanting to fight. Um, to be fair to guard, but it's easy to freeze when you, you're overmatched and you're on a big stage like that. It's really easy to freeze. Um, he knew what his role was in that fight, and I guess he did He did all right to survive as long as he did. Um, and then I caught the Paddy Donovan ball fight, which I was really looking forward to that fight because I've seen Paddy Donovan once or twice and I absolutely loved his style and what it was about. And having a kid like him who can, I like guys who are the boxers and the sharpshooters, but they're really, really good at holding the spot all the time. And all too often we see kids come from GB backgrounds and they've all got the same homogenized style, but it's all about the fencing, the one two, the hook, the pivot, spin off, you know, not great inside, not great at holding that mid ring center. They're just about the skills. And when it gets hard, 
they've got something missing. And I thought Paddy Donovan, I thought it looked brilliant. It's really great as well from a, an ex-coach's point of view to see a kid pull off shots and pull off sequences that you know he's done in the ring and in the gym and on the pads and in the sparring a thousand times and he's worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And I, I thought it looked absolutely brilliant. All right, ball's not world class. He's nowhere near the top fringes of, you know, the top level in Britain. But I thought Donovan looks absolute quality. And what I will say, I'm not going to go into it too much because people think I've got this thing and I can't help myself sometimes. And I didn't want to mention it. I wanted to bite my hand. But there's a perfect opponent for Conor Ben. Oh, Paddy Donovan. It'd be an absolute mismatch. Conor Ben would get taken apart by a kid like that. You think he's that good? Destroy Conor Ben. It'd be a be an easy fight. Easy fight for Donovan. He's so far ahead of him in terms of skill set. Yeah, it'd be beat him easily. And I'm not saying I'm not saying Panny Donovan's the next um Thomas Hearns. I'm not suggesting that for one minute. I just think that's why, you know, we talk about fights. There's a fight there for Conor Ben. That's a great fight for Conor Ben. Uh, Conor Ben's calling out Boots Enos. Have you seen that? Well, I can call out Tyson Fury, but I'm not going to take that fight and it's not going to happen, is it? It's oh. it's just uh, lip service yet again, isn't it, from him? It's lip service, but what I have wondered about, I know we're going to talk about the show, we're not going to talk about the Conor Ben situation. It's my fault. I, I, I brought him up. But even though I'm sure they're working on the Ben and Eubank fight and they're going to announce it for whenever they said, I don't know when they said, February or whatever, even though they're working on that fight, isn't it funny how Eddie seems to be less obsessed in that fight now he's got a foothold in this heavyweight picture that's going on? I'm wondering if, uh, with this Saudi money and everything else, I'm wondering if Conor Ben's no longer that number one priority for Eddie. Well, Eddie's obviously seen this 270-page dossier that they paid hundreds of thousands for, because you'd want to do if you were his promoter, wouldn't you? He's yeah. seen it, and nobody else was allowed to see it. So Eddie's had a look at it and thought, oof, we can't put this out. That's what I'm hearing behind the scenes. Yeah, he's, he's going to serve a retrospective ban and then him and the board will be fine. And because we won't get to know the details of what's actually happened, there'll be some NDA signed or something. It'll be, you know, that's between us. Conor Ben's now licensed by the Board of Control, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sure at some point he'll be back out there and he'll get badly exposed. Um, but if he's called in Boots Ennis out, it's all he's doing is he's, he's gone through a list of, old, faded, former champions. None of them's really worked out. You know, he's talked about Kel Brook, he's talked about Manny Pacquiao, I remember that one, and now he's on about Eubank Jr. and various other things. And I guess at some point, when those things don't happen, people start to say, hang on a minute, there's some real world-class fighters at World away you know, on the surface, and why are you calling those guys out? So he's suddenly, for the first time, called someone out who's got a pulse. Well, I go back to that fight. I mean, people if people think if people think Paddy Donovan wouldn't beat Conor Ben, then I'd I'd see boxing differently to you. So mm. we we know he's leapfrogged domestic level and he hasn't leapfrogged it because his head and shoulders above these guys. He's leap leapfrogged it because he's called Ben, called Conor Ben. I think that's the same situation as Hans of Bob. No, well, hands of, hands of form's gone. He's gone the route that we thought it would go, hasn't he, Campbell? He's gone the route of... And by the way, I, I, there's a lot more modesty when it comes to Campbell Hatton. But he's gone the route of either you get the... In, in the early days, you get the Eastern European fighters, the international fighters who have got really bad records. Um, and then he's gone towards now this very lower level domestic central area level, southern area level, non-punching opponents. He's gone for those guys now, hasn't he? Um, and as I've said to you before, I think the, the knockout percentage of Conor Ben and Campbell Hatton's opposition is very, very low. So they're both clearly avoiding punches. Well, they're avoiding pulses, really, aren't they, if we're being completely honest. Uh, but Campbell, Hatton, Campbell Hatton's a nice, nice kid. 
got no issue with Campbell Hatton doing what he's doing, and he's not calling boots any sound, is he? No, he ain't. Uh, but Crush has got to live up to hype, hasn't he, after being in that Essex boy Marbella movie, hasn't he? <laughs> Listen, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't know what that is, but it's... Yeah, we'll move on from him, mate, because I said to people, in his next three fights, he'll get exposed, forgotten about, and Eddie might have a foot in the heavyweight picture, and then he, he won't care too much about Conor Ben. Yeah, uh, getting back to uh, Eddie's uh, show in Ireland, in Dublin, uh, Thomas Carty won. Uh, we'll go. We'll go through the bottom one. Zelfa Barrett. Did you see that one? Not seen anything other than Paddy Donovan, Reese Mould, um, against Cully, and obviously the main event. I think just those three fights were the ones I watched. That Sky Nicholson against Lucy Wilder. That looked like two birds in Witherspoons fighting, didn't it? Didn't watch it. Not seen it. Won't watch it. Don't care. Paddy Donovan. Okay. Uh, Gary Cully, Reese Mould. That was a split decision win for Gary. How did you have that? Could have gone either way, couldn't it, really? I'll tell, you how I scored, I'll tell you exactly how I scored it. It was a good fight. I scored it five rounds each. Yeah. I thought Reese Mould's better defensive work and sort of more solid shots won his five rounds a little bit more convincingly than Gary Cully's um, five rounds that I gave him. Um, because a lot of it were the fencing I talked about that what I hate so much. But he had a couple of good rounds where he got back into his rhythm. But I, I thought Reese Mould had good tactics throughout that fight. It could never, people think you just got to walk these guys down. You can't when you're giving so much height and reach. You have to sit on the outside, tease them, tease them, and then time it. You've got to time the advances. Otherwise, you're in fresh air and you'd be exhausted. So, I thought Reese Mould's tactics were good. I had it a draw. Um, and it's one of those fights where I thought Reese's rounds were more dominant than Cully's rounds. But by the way we score fights, we don't give half a point rounds, do we? We give full point rounds. So I had think, it 95, 95. Do you think, Julian, that after the penultimate round, they could have got all the scorecards up and said, right, these are cards, lads. So it's close, so... And let and let and so they could go for it in last round a bit more. Do you think that'd have been a good idea for future? I don't know. I always I always wrestle with that one. They tried uh, it, didn't they? At one point, didn't they? With WBC, won it? Well, I had a we had a kid, a good friend of mine, he's a godfather to two of my lads, and I am in uh, Mally McIver. It was a good, good, useful amateur, open class amateur, and it was in the ABA. You, uh, he won the ABA Yorkshire final when he was in the quarterfinals. And me and Keith Tate were in the corner. And Mally was boxing a, a good kid. It was a kid called Kevin Bennett. Bennett was a, he was well known. He was a useful kid. I think he got to the ABA final. And it was when they used to tell you that what the points were at the end of the each round in the amateurs. Yeah. And at the end of the first round, it was when they do clean hits. Remember those three people pressing the button. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but at the end of the round, Keith said, shouted to me. He says, Jules, he goes, they gave it 4-0 four, four to Bennett. And Mally boxed really well in the first round. And it was just... It's just George, it was Joe coming in. And they, they had Mali 4-0 four, four down. What I'm going to get to, I'm labouring over it, but they had him 4-0 down and it was a close round and he boxed really well and it just set Mali off. He goes, what, I'm 4-0 down? And he went from boxing then to just getting involved in a brawl and he got, and Mali was a boxer, he was a very, very good boxer and he got involved in a brawl. It went, it was, it was four twos and he got a couple of standing counts against him, one it third, one it fourth because he just went off his game plan. Sometimes knowing the score is a good thing, Russell, but what I'm saying is sometimes it really throws people off. And you could argue, well, Mali were never going to get that decision anyway, doing what he was doing. But it, I saw the opposite thing of that, and I saw the wrong side of that when I saw a kid who was a beautiful boxer, realised he was down on the point scoring, and it changed everything. I mean, fights that are close, I don't know. You're never going to sort scoring out in boxing because it's a 10-point must system. You know, it's, for example, 
everything's subjective, but this is where I sometimes have a a debate or a, a not a debate, I wrestle with myself because as I've just said, you can get someone who wins five rounds quite clearly. And then you can get the other person who wins five rounds by the skin of his teeth or her skin of her teeth. And it's still 95-95, isn't it? But when you look at the fight holistically as an overall fight, you think that the guy who did the heavier work and the cleaner work in those five rounds overall wins that fight. But it's scored how it's scored. It's scored 10-point must system. That's boxing. That's how boxing's scored. Um, I don't know what you can do, um, but I've no arguments with Gary Culler getting the decision. But you can also feel why um, Reese Mould and, and his, his team will be a little bit aggrieved by that as well. It's just... It is what it is. It's yeah. been the ten point must. It's always a dis- you know. It's always a bit like that with split decisions. As you know, no, no, no team accepts it. Do they? One of teams is never going to accept it, are they? No, no. And, and this is is there's an element of subjectivity, but there's also the rules which uh, should remove subjectivity. But yeah, no one likes losing a close decision. But you know, it happens through the amateurs. Reese Reese might have had a couple of close decisions in the amateurs that he thought. You know, he might have got beat on and, and he got them. It's just, it is what it is. But people also cry robbery. And robber is a, a really difficult word to use because a robbery is when, well, Penel Whitaker, Jose Luis Ramirez in Paris is a robbery. Jack Catterell, Josh Taylor is a robbery. A robbery is when one fight clearly, clearly dominates another and is several rounds up on the scorecard, six, seven points up. When you've got a guy or a, a fighter who wins by a point, all you hear now and the day after is people saying robbery, robbery, robbery. And it's like it's not a robbery. It's it's a razor thin fight where you know a, a judge who scored the fight has seen it a little bit different to how you've seen it. So Reese wasn't robbed, but I thought he boxed well, and he doesn't really impact your career too much, does it? You you lose a fight on a split. No big deal. He'll, he'll he'll go back and he'll and he'll think again. I do wonder if he's actually a lightweight. I know he was a featherweight and then he moved to super feather. And I do wonder if Reese is a lightweight. If I'm honest, yeah, he's massive. His colour isn't he as well? I mean that guy's bone dry when he gets in the ring. That I wondered if he was fully hydrated last night. That Cully, God knows what Cully walks around at. I bet if you see Cully. You know, ten weeks from a fight, and you see Reece small ten weeks from a fight. There'll be there'll be a full size difference between those two guys. You reckon? Yeah, massively. Uh, the main event. We had a fight six months ago. Yep. Uh, Chantel Cameron won very comfortably. The first one. The. Although one at judges, Jesus. Anyway, but Chantel Cameron won the first one. This one, a bit different. How did you have it, Julian? I had Taylor winning. Um, Cameron, she she's one of those. The rules are now, and as it stands, the rules are. I know we changed it with Serrano. The rules are these are two minute rounds. If ever a female boxer was going to be more suited to three minute rounds, it's Chantel Cameron, but. The fight last night was 10 twos, and Katie Taylor's so proficient when it comes to the two minute rounds because of the style that she's got. I thought Cameron looked different last night, there was something different about her work. Um, I noticed she wasn't dipping even from the first five seconds, she wasn't dipping looking for those body shots. The body shots in the first fight really took. Taylor's legs under from under in the first two or three rounds. And I don't know if Taylor had prepared more diligently. There was a bit more, bit more feet, feet movement in that fight. But both of those fighters looked like different fighters last night. So I thought Katie Taylor either looked a little bit old last time or underperformed. And I thought Cameron last time just fought an unbelievable fight. But last night, I thought Katie Taylor was so determined and and so switched on. But I thought Chantal Cameron just didn't look great last night. And it was interesting because five, ten minutes before they do the ring walks, they, they always show you the VTs, don't they? And they were, 
Katie, T um, sorry, Chantal Cameron was talking and I, she was saying how she's felt disrespected as a champion, the fact that she's, you know, had to do this again. And they always say, don't they, that when you've beaten one person convincingly the first time around, getting yourself up for that rematch and motivating yourself up for that rematch is really, really hard to do. And I think there's just something about the way she was talking. I was watching it going, she's really not feeling this fight. you got to feel a fight. you got to be pumped up and feel that fight. Um, I've had fighters who have gone into rematches having beaten kids quite comfortable before and have struggled the second time around. You know, Gary Sykes beat Johnny Case quite comfortably, boxed him two years later for the British title. Sykes got dropped and he had to really drag it out. It was just... You train hard, but you don't oh, train. Did he, did he win that one? He, won, he them won them both, but he got dropped in the second fight with Johnny Kays and he was behind on points when he stopped him. I thought he was behind. It was what I'm saying, Russell, is when you train with fear, or maybe fear is not the right word, when you train with adrenaline as an underdog going into the lion's den, you have an edge about you that suddenly you become the champion. What do they say? To be to stay a champion, you've got to train like the challenger. Mm. And there was just something. Uh, uh, Max hears me talk about this all the time. Max, I, I watch body language. I listen to verbals and, and non-verbals all the time. And there was something about Chantel Cameron listening to her. You know, talking about the fight. She wasn't feeling it, and I thought she was slow to get off the mark. She had a decent first round. She had a decent, good first round, but there was just something not spiteful about her work. Remember the first fight. She had a good finish with some good uppercuts, but there was something really spiteful about her in that first four rounds five months ago, and I didn't see the spite from her last night. People might argue it was the cuts what threw her off, but I, I don't think so. I think I'd go even further back than the opening bell, and I've been there, like I said, I've experienced it, and going over old ground and feeling disrespected, Feeling, why have I got to travel again? Why am I in the away? You know, why am I effectively the away fighter again? I'm the champion. It plays on people's minds, and I don't think it had a positive um, impact on her at all. What did you think about the first round, Julian? I've sent you, so you and I are going to disagree. Comments will come in. I'm blind. I'll encourage anybody to watch, not the highlight, don't watch the highlight, watch the replay of the actual show. Watch the end of the first round, the replay. When she got, when Taylor went over, I watched that and I said, wow, slam jab, she's put her over. And then he called it no knockdown. I went, that was a knockdown, that was a knockdown. And then I saw the replay last night in real time, didn't pause it, so I wanted to watch the fight. And I went, oh, I I don't think that punch landed, but, but how did she go over? And then I sent you, I broke it down, I recorded it from my TV and I slowed it down in on my phone. And anyone who's going to say I'm talking shit, watch the replay and slow it down. Um, I've sent it to Russell, so Russell will send it on to you. I'll tell you exactly what happened. Sometimes in boxing you see things in the blink of an eye and you think you've seen something. And then when you microscopically slow it down, you don't see what you see. I'll tell you exactly what happened. So there's something called Terry. I don't mean to offend anybody. People might know this, but there's 16, 17, 18 ways of defending a jab. Any coach worth his salt should be able to show you at least nine or 10 ways to defend a jab. Now, one of the ways to defend a jab is what's called a double block. Mm. Now, Katie Taylor is really good at that double block. Now, when Chantel Cameron went to throw that jab, Katie Taylor went for the double block. If you watch it very, very slow down. And that jab, it went, obviously, it went through past the front and the lead hand. It went through the back hand and it hit, or it looked to hit or partially hit or just touch Katie Taylor on the shoulder. Katie Taylor, watch Katie Taylor's head as you watch the replay. Her head never moves. Even with a light jab, your head would move a little bit. If you got hit with a slam jab, your head would really come back. Her head never moved. It just glanced the shoulder and Katie Taylor, what you taught to do as, a, as an elite amateur, off the double block, she threw a jab back herself 
This was real good textbook stuff. And as she threw that jab back herself, Chantel Cameron caught Katie Taylor's jab. And I think it was the momentum of the double block, pulling back and throwing the jab and hitting, jabbing Chantel Cameron's glove and the feet not being right. And she went over. The punch never hit her. And the momentum of the movement. What about, for them people that don't understand that, what about the fact that uh, Chantel threw her jab and touched Katie Taylor's arm or something and it knocked her down? do not that count as a knockdown? You know, it's got to have... It's, got to have, it's, it's a knockdown. The punch has to have, has to have impact. It was... You can't, if you can't touch someone... We know that the rules of boxing, right? If, you, if you're off balance and you touch someone on the shoulder... And they go down. Some people, that's a knockdown. It's you're not knocked down. It, it's a, it's a balanced thing. It was like that was a, that was a tricky one. I always watch this stuff in slow motion. The Tommy Fury Jake Paul one. Remember the was it the last round when? Six rounds. Tommy, I, I'm going to get this wrong because I, I haven't broke it down for ages. Tommy, six or hit. eight round, wasn't it? Yeah, he got hit square with a jab. But as he threw his jab and he was leaning over, it was literally. His feet, his feet tripped and he went over. That was no, more of a Tommy's, case. One Tommy's a knockdown then, Fury. I'm just going to say there was more of an argument with Tommy's, but Katie Taylor's looked like a knockdown, right? It looked like a knockdown. And when you see it in real time, it looks like a knockdown. But there was an angle at the end of the first round when DeZone replayed it. And you can hear Andy Lee and Darren Barker, who are biased set of commentators, by the way. You, you can hear them go, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, I know this like kind of, Oh, and there was not. I look at I look at certain things when a fighter when there's a when there's a questionable knockdown. I look at certain thing, things. I look at the person who's been knocked down. Have they got that embarrassment, glassy eyed kind of like? Oh, I'm going to try and hide it, or do they just get up and it's like there was nothing at all. I don't know where that came from. And then I look at the opponent to see if they. If they drop someone, you'd absolutely tear back in at them. And I just think... And it... I'll ask you this question, Julian. If it were a crack on chin and he didn't give it, a clear crack on chin, would Andy Lee, an Irishman, and Darren Barker... It's horrendous, Matt... those guys. The, the, awful. Barker. The, the first commentary was awful. The first commentary... I watched the replay of the, like the first fight uh, midweek. I thought I'd watch it again. And I watched it. And... The first four rounds, I thought Cameron really put it on Taylor. And the way they were talking, they were calling every single Katie Taylor shot. Good shot from Taylor. Good hook from Taylor. And I'm just going... I'm coming to now. The, uh, do you think they... Horrific. Darren, horrific. Obviously, he's biased in Ibarca. He's a matchroom employee. He's married into matchroom, isn't he? And uh, I love her. She's a nice woman. He's married. And the... The other kid, Andy Lee, well, he's from Olympic, uh, Olymp an amateur, amateur background like Katie Taylor, isn't it, at a similar age. So why would they be even commentating? And would they have called it a knockdown if it whacked her on chin? I don't think they would have anyway if Ref didn't give it, would you? Because they all sort of went silent, didn't it? Well, they did. Oh, so you're saying this, Julian, now you don't think it was a knockdown. Well, that's your opinion, fair enough. It looked like it was one to me, but they didn't know what to do and it all went eerily because nobody wanted to say out and be known as buyer. So it all went sort of silent, didn't it? Well, do we agree? Let, let's be open now. So I've sent you the slow motion video this morning. All right, let me have another look at it. Before people jump on me. Yeah, before people watch, jump on you. Before people watch the slow... No, I'm not talking the slow motion. I don't think this will work, by the way. Um, let me have a look at this. Go on then, yeah. Keep it there. Oh, I don't know, mate. No, 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 no. What now? Watch the one I've I've slowed down several times. There's no way that punch hits her. Watch it. Right, hang on. I'm I'm not. I, by the way, before anybody jumps on me, I think you all know me well enough to know I'm pretty honest, and I'd actually don't give a shit who wins that fight. I couldn't care less who wins the fight. Right. Watch it several times. Watch the double block. Watch it just ever so slightly glance his shoulder and watch Katie Taylor's left hand hit Chantel Cameron's right glove. It hits her on top of the chest, doesn't it? 
It's a chest, isn't it? It's a chest punch, isn't it? A jab. And she's off balance. But that's a scoring shot into the chest, though, isn't it? Not a chest, mate. You just touch it. Touch it sure, it's it like Katie Taylor's left, above her left chest part of her body. Watch Katie, watch Katie Taylor's jab after the shot be caught by Chantel Cam's right glove, and that's what sends her off balance. Watch it. Keep watching it. I think I've done it three, four times. Now, that's not what we thought we saw in the first round. Why did her arms go back like that, though, then? Because she lost her balance. It's what you do. You double block, you shoot. You double block, you shoot. That's what that's what you're taught to do. You double block, you shoot. You, you block, you shoot. Your front hand block, you shoot. You parry, you shoot. You pull back. It's what it's what you're taught to do. It's it's a weird, it's a very, very weird knockdown. But a 10 out 10 8 round would have been harsh. And you've got to remember this referees get stuff wrong. They get stuff wrong. The referee has got the absolute best view in the house. And what, did you, what did you think to the referee's performance overall? Do you think he uh, had a good one? I'd have to watch it again. Genuinely, I have to watch it again because I'm I'm watching how I watch fights. You know, you notice bad decisions. You notice skullduggery. But Max will tell you this when I watch a fight. I, I'm watching the boxers. I don't give a shit about anybody else or what anything else that's going on. I'm looking because I'm always, it's just how I am. I'm breaking it down and I'm looking for certain things what I would do. I'm looking for repeat movement. I'm looking for patterns. I, I can't help but what I don't watch boxing as a fan. I watch boxing as a coach. It's just what's in me. And I'm not really watching the referee. It's like Joe Cortez had a real got a lot of stick after the Hatton fight, and I had to watch the fight two or three times to really focus on the referee and not focus on um, Hatton and Mayover. I was watching Taylor, and I was watching Cameron, and I was watching them. Um, I don't think there were any head butts. I think there were a load of head clashes. I think again, there's a you've got sometimes you have a clash of styles. Okay, I'll explain. So you got Chantal Cameron, who's a really good pressure fighter, really good inside fighter. You've got Katie Taylor, who, who who raids. She throws clusters of shots. She's a little bit reckless. Cameron, Cameron has the eye hands and she dips in and she dips in. You got someone who's dipping in against someone who's looking to time with fast right hand, left up, right hand, left up combinations at such a pace, at a crazy, crazy pace. There were going to be headbutts in that fight. It's going to happen. We got a nasty cut on the forehead of Chantel Cameron. Luckily, it wasn't on the eye, so it didn't um, cause the bleed. I, I did wonder, part of me did wonder as a coach, whether I would have said after three, four rounds, look, we're clearly going to have to do this again. You, you recognise when your fighter's not firing. And Cameron wasn't firing last night like she was in the first fight. And I might have said, nope, go, go on for the technical draw. That's my what I might have done. But um, the brave, that's the do what they do. Um, as far as I'm aware, the referee didn't take any points off Katie Taylor. Mm. Is, it an inten is it an intentional headbutt? Is it a butt? Or is it a head clash? And... The, the head clash, the, the person who gets cut always comes off worse. It's a, it's an unfortunate thing. I think it happened with um, Lee Selby and Josh Warrington, didn't it? I think Selby got cut. And I think in that case, I think it really detracted from Selby. Warrington's cut a few up, hasn't he, is Ed? I remember the, when Selby got cut, it was not just battling a ferocious prime Josh Warrington and the crowd and everything else and the sentiment he was really, really badly cut with Selby and he just seemed to just throw him out of his game plan completely. Whereas, I think at least last night it was a nasty cut, but they both, they both looked like they'd been through a meat grinder last night, didn't they? Katie Taylor and Cameron have both got bumps and lumps and black eyes and swollen noses. So that, I think the one thing that people are not talking about, it was a great fight. It was a fantastic fight to watch. Uh, they're looking at doing a third one. Oh, sorry. Scoring one one judge had it six rounds different to other, which is what we're used to now, anyway, isn't it? Uh, 
they're looking at uh, doing a, a third one, but they're saying if that happens, there'll be a rematch clause for that. So it could be a fourth, couldn't it? Plus and many... minus, minus minus minuses, minuses, right? Go, is there? There's not many places for them girls to go now with competition, is it? So you I'm could just say, that. right? I have no issue with trilogies. If they're great fights and there's nowhere really else to go. Yeah. Um, if you look at Gatti and Ward, Gatti and Ward were both dance partners and they almost defined each other. But Gatti and Ward, whilst good world class fighters in their own. And no rematch clauses. It, it's, it's boxing, isn't it? I mean, I'm hearing that Anthony Joshua's got a rematch clause with, with uh, Otto Wallin. It's just boxing. Yeah. It's just... The, 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 tell the problem I've got, the biggest problem I've got with rematch clauses and trilogies and all this kind of stuff is now a trilogy. Hopefully it does not doesn't take as long here with these two ladies, but a trilogy now takes you three years, doesn't it? Two years. Yeah. It puts everybody else on notice. Whereas, you know, when you got trilogies in the 40s and 50s and 60s, generally, not in every case, but generally, they happen pretty quickly. I mean, Jake, Jake LaMotta and um, Ray Robinson fought twice in two weeks, didn't they, at one point? That's how crazy it was. But listen, Chantel Cameron is going to make a hell of a lot more money being, unfortunately, being the, the right-hand side of the bill and having to dance to Katie Taylor and Eddie Hearn's tune than she would do if she's defending her, her undisputed title in a Northamptonshire leisure centre against some obscure ranked opponent and TV wouldn't have much interest in that. It's boxing, it's business, and unfortunately that's that's just the way it is, and Chantel Cameron will make a hell of a lot of money for a third fight. So it's up to her which route she wants to go. Yeah. Bean, uh, Bean's back on scene. Looks like he's took a job at Dazon. Why do you think that is? I mean, you know, Bean, you know what? he's been around years, hasn't he? Right? Why ain't he back at Sky? Why ain't he gone back to Sky? What's gone wrong there? And why is Hearn giving him a chance? Is that because they looked after Hearn back in the day? Or he knows where all the bodies are buried? Do you want to be honest? Yeah. First well, I've heard of it. First, I've heard about it, mate. I don't know what you're on about. <laughs> oh. I don't, I don't, as you say, I don't, I don't watch this stuff. I don't follow this stuff. I, I have no idea that. So, so Adam Smith's going to the zone. Yeah, we were working it with the zone. No idea. That's, that's, that's tickled me. That's quite funny. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought Adam Smith was, again, I thought it was really poorly. Well, he anyway, was at that show last night. Was he? Yeah, he was there last night. Yeah, did he, show, did he show you him? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a. I've yeah, told you this is what I'm at. I, I don't. I just I watched the fights. Oh, that's it. Video. Right, I watched the fights, and I never, I never saw Adam Smith. Um, I saw Ed Sheeran. I saw him at ringside. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a cracking fight. I thought. I think Chantel Cameron was unlucky in the role that she was put in. Um, it's the it's the harsh realities of boxing. She's never going to be the A side against the Irish darling. I do think Katie Taylor's had a fantastic career. I don't care what anybody says. I think she's been a phenomenal boxer. And I thought Chantel Cameron was sub par last night in all aspects of the game. Never mind the heads. Never mind was it knocked down? Was it not? I thought she was sub par, and I certainly didn't think. Um, I'll tell you what I would love. Pay them more. Pay them 50% more. Let's make the trilogy. Let's do it at Croker Park. And let's do that over 10 three-minute rounds. They're both elite. They're both the best in the division. I think that over 10 threes would be a different fight, but it would be a phenomenal fight um, for women's boxing to showcase the best over the men's distance. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I, don't, I, I just think... I get the two minute round, but there's some elite fighters. I just want to see them slow down a little bit. And there's not many women who who I think are right for three minute rounds. But I think if ever a woman's fight was going to be right for three minute rounds, it's that fight last night. All right. So I think we're we're done, Russell. And I, you, I think you sent yeah. some pictures. Is it Adam Smith? Yeah. Yeah. 
Good old Adam Smith. He's always there. Know, he's he interviewing her. Is he talking to her? Oh, I'll show you one. Oh, here goes one there. 